Hello everyone, I'm Brian, and welcome back. We'll continue, but real quick, the question I'll answer at the end is, why are you so interested in Hindu stuff? So I'll answer that at the end if I remember, which I should, <laughs> but let's go ahead and get started. Third time also, you could not do that. Then Sri Ramakrishna, you see, Yoga Kshema Vahamyam, Sri Ramakrishna said, all right. He was very happy secretly. That's what he wanted from Narendranath. He said, all right. Your family will never lack plain food and clothes. He never said that they're going to become millionaires. They'll just get, just, they'll just get by. I, I, I assure you that much. And that they did, definitely. So the Lord takes care of his own. This one-pointedness comes in life. Ananyata, there's a beautiful word, ananyata. One-pointedness comes in life when you lead life like this. One of the factors that we have to take care of is, in Sanskrit they say, Anya Ashrayanam Tyagaha. Give up all other support in life. We have many supports in life. What makes us feel good? I am rich. That's my support in life. I have millions. That's one support. The attitude is, no, not wealth. My support is the Lord. Wealth is there today, gone tomorrow. I am young and beautiful and strong. That's there today and gone tomorrow. That's true. I, I saw the picture of Muhammad Ali, you know. And towards the end, how uh, he, he's, he became the, the Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, I think. So this one of the strongest, most fierce fighters in the world, trembling, hardly able to control his own body. It goes away. Everything in life goes away. All physical strength and health and beauty and youth, everything fades away. I was just saying, I think yesterday, even if you practice a lot of yoga and eat gluten-free all your life, <laughs> still, the most gluten-free yogi is also going to get old and, uh, and, and die. So, all of that goes away. Our depend, we depend on the Lord alone and nothing else. Ashraya, my refuge is the Lord. Not anything else. Power. Most powerful man in the world or in, in the company or some. That also, that should not be my refuge. That I depend on that. God plus my wealth or my power. No. God alone. Hmm. Give up all other supports. Doesn't, doesn't mean that you're going to give up your bank balance and resign from your position <laughs> of power. All that may be there outside. But internally know that I depend on only the Lord. Be practical, basically. Don't don't assume to just throw away everything you have in life. Continue it, but of course, focus on uh, on focus on your devotion. But be practical. That's the thing that that I I, 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 I keep repeating in some of these things is the fact that um, you know, be practical about it and don't don't fall for false prophets, false gurus, false swamis, or anything like that. Be devotion. Don't be a fool. Devote yourself, but be practical. I remember I met this professor of religion uh, from McGill University, Canada. I met her at an uh, interfaith conference in India. And she's very interesting. She is Jewish, but very interested in Buddhism. And um, she's a professor of religion, and she also practices Thai kickboxing. Now she said, I always wanted to be a Buddhist nun. I really, really want that. But I have a little daughter. And I cannot give up my daughter like that. I mean, I cannot be a nun and, and you know, like abandon my daughter. How, how, what can I do? I just remembered Sri Ramakrishna's beautiful saying. He says, little children play. They catch hold of a pillar and they swing round and round. And it's fun. And they, they squeal with laughter. And, and they, but they are very careful not to let go of the pillar. Because they know they let go of the pillar, they'll be thrown aside and they'll get hurt. So that's important to hold on to the pillar. Similarly in life, hold on to God and do everything else. Everything else that comes in your life, you can do that. Do that. You take care of your daughter, your profession, but hold on to your spiritual life as the center. Let right there. <laughs> He just explained it, basically. Obviously, still devote yourself, but be practical with your life. Let everything be el else be the periphery. Your profession, your daughter, your, your relationships, everything else is there as a periphery. But central thing is, is your spiritual practice. 
I didn't say God because when she was Buddhist. <laughs> but your, your spiritual quest is the center. <laughs> the center of your being is your spirituality. This is the difference between this second approach, the higher practice of bhakti and the earlier practice of bhakti. In, in, the, in the beginning stages, bhakti or spirituality is one of the things in my life. But other things are more, more important. But here spirituality becomes the central thing in life. I have always find it inspiring that Mahatma Gandhi said, people think, who am I? People think that I am a politician. Some people think that I am a freedom fighter. Others think that I am a social reformer. But if you ask me, I am a simple man in search of God. I am a simple man in search of God. Now remember, as a simple man in search of God, he did not give up his freedom struggle against the British or his uh, attempts uh, or his reforms of uh, Indian society. Or multifarious activities, a very busy and packed life. He didn't give it up. All of that are in the peripheries. That's going round and round holding on to the pillar. The central thing is, I am a simple man in search of God. Anya Ashrayanam Tyaga. Give up all other supports. Don't define yourself by those supports. Religious practices also. You see, there's a subtle point here. Sometimes religious practices become my support. God is not the support. The religious practices are the support. Mm. Some people do japa, repeat the mantra. They do meditation. For what? One Swami put it beautifully. They do all their practices. They pray to God, they repeat the mantra of God, they meditate, and in exchange they want ask for the world they, wor they ask for the world. They do spiritual practices to, to please the Lord, and when the Lord is pleased, their prayer is give me the world. Power, <coughs> wealth, success. Exchanging spirituality for the world. One Devotee came up to Swami Brahmananda in Belurmat and bowed down to him and said, Swami, you are, it is extraordinary, the sacrifice that you have made. You have given up the world for God. And that's why I bow down to you. And the Swami said, I bow down to you even more deeply because I have given up worthless pieces of glass for a diamond. You have thrown away the diamond for glass, glass pieces. <laughs> you have given up God for the world. I bow down to you. Gre greater is your renunciation. <laughs> Don't exchange spiritual practices for, for things of the world. It should be the other way around. Even there, spiritual practices done for God realization, even there we can be led astray. A monk wrote to the Holy Mother from the Rishikesh where he was practicing meditation in the foothills of the Himalayas. And the letter was read out to the Holy Mother. This monk is writing, Ma, I have done so much of japas, repeated the mantra. I've done so much meditation. But the Lord is not pleased to show himself to me. I, have no, I don't have the vision of God. When will Thakur, Sri Ramakrishna, show himself to me? Now this annoyed the mother. She said right back to him that do you think God is a sack of potatoes that you can go to the market and, and purchase? I have done so much meditation, so much repeating the mantra, and therefore I'm Lord sorry. has to appear before me. God has to appear before me. I have purchased, the God, uh, uh, purchased God. You cannot do that. And this is this is uh, something that I see just in everyday life, even say non-religious stuff. Like people are entitled, said, "Well, I done this, therefore I am entitled to something." And this is something that I personally I try not to think of. I whenever I do something, I expect nothing, and it's weird to say that because it's how do I say? I can't remember now. I just I just literally thought of it. I forgot. But basically, I do something. I expect nothing. And if if there's anything that comes off of it, that's fantastic. And I guess this goes back to my world religion class uh, back in college when um, uh, it was about learn again that that one that that one piece of the world religion class about Buddhism is something that really had a, a major change in my life. Whereas uh, again, I can only paraphrase. I remember the ideas, the general ideas behind it, which is basically. Give it 110%, but expect nothing of it. And if something comes of it, that's fantastic. But if nothing comes of it, well, then you're expecting nothing. And you won't be disappointed. It's it's like a really low expectation, but it's really a decent way of looking at life. You know, 
if you, if uh, I guess the example she gave, if you, if you start working, studying really, really, really hard on your test, and all of a sudden, when you take your test and you don't get an A, you're gonna be so, you're gonna be so depressed and and like sorry, and and you're gonna be in pain and suffering because you didn't get an A because of how hard you worked. You expected an A because you worked really, really hard at it, and you know it's kind of that's just end up you end up suffering because you expect so much from it. You had high expectations, but uh, yeah, and that's kind of the path or the path, the idea, way of life that I've kind of learned from that class is to to do the best you've got and expect nothing. And it's worked out pretty well so far for me. I mean, obviously it's not a hundred percent because I still have an expectation, but the expectation is low. The Lord appears, reveals himself to you by sheer grace, not because of our spiritual practices. And then she writes, she says, write to him. He is a sadhu. If he will not repeat the mantra, what will he do? Tell him when the Lord is pleased, the Lord will appear before him. And he is a sadhu. Till that time, if he is not going to repeat his mantra, if he is not going to do spiritual practices, what else will he do? In Kashi, in Benares, a monk he went, he had gone out, he got into some trouble. Um, and he had gone outside in the evening and he got into some trouble outside when it was reported to Swami Turiyananda, Hari Maharaj, that this young monk got into trouble, did something unmonastic. He said the first, his first reaction was, Shondavala Shadu Ashon Chede Jabe Kano. In the evening, uh, after sunset, why is this, is this monk away from his meditation mat? He should be sitting on his meditation mat all, all evening, all night. Why is he outside? Why is he gone outside the ashram? Why? So, Anya Ashrayanam Tyaga, focus on spiritual life and hold on to the Lord alone. Don't even think that my spiritual practices, because I have got spiritual practices, now I will get God. No. I have got only God. Of course, spiritual practices I will do because I am a spiritual seeker. I am a lover of God. I will do spiritual practices. But it all depends on the grace of God. I have no other refuge. In Bengali, there is a saying, Rakhe hori to mare ke, mare, uh, mare hori rakhe ke. Yes. If the Lord protects you, who can destroy you? If the Lord lets go of you, who can protect you? Nobody. So, the, our refuge is God and only God. There are signs of this, this higher kind of bhakti. A delight, an internal delight in the spiritual practices. You do puja. You decorate the picture or the image of the Lord. There's the whole technology of puja in Hinduism. It's a very beautiful practice. Professor Jeffrey Long, who was here last, uh, last week, I think, two weeks ago. He gave a nice talk in uh, Belur Mat. Uh, I heard him give a talk. Uh, he said uh, that how these practices have spread in America. One of his friends, an American lady, and he was talking to uh, this lady over phone and talking about Hinduism. And this lady said, no, no, I don't consider myself a Hindu. Why should I consider myself a Hindu? And she was saying, these are the reasons why I don't consider myself a Hindu. And after some time, she said, okay, Jeff, I've got to go now. Uh, time for my puja. <laughs> I have to do my puja now. <laughs> so it's a very beautiful practice where you decorate the image of the Lord or a picture of the Lord with flowers and then you chant mantras, you offer the bale leaves or the tulsi leaves and then you offer uh, flowers and incense and the light and then you offer fruits and, uh, and food offerings. You bathe the Lord. It's all uh, uh, done in using the power of imagination, visualization. You're bathing the Lord, um, you, you're wiping the Lord clean, and you give a new set of clothes, and, and then um, uh, you, you wave the light, the arati. Then you follow it up, up by chanting, by singing, by kirtan, by the recitation of stava. And it should always have a joy within. It should be a living practice. All of this can become, can deteriorate into a mechanical practice. Many people do puja, and it becomes mechanical. There's no, it becomes some uh, kind of repetitive ritual. And um, I was actually a little bit earlier thinking, I wonder if there's a way to, uh, I want to say avoid, but 
do you always have to do your mantras or your pujas? Is it something that is always mandatory? And I was thinking there's like the method that I would hope that would work. It would be where you don't have to do that, where every day you're just, like he's saying, devoting everything to God, where you don't have to practice the, the mantras or anything like that, where it's just automatic. You're always devoting, you're always doing things for God, and no matter what it is, it's always for God. And then the mantras and the pujas hopefully are not necessary. But I'm wondering if maybe that that particular way I'm thinking is more along the lines of the non-duality version. When you realize <clears throat> everything is God. Therefore, anything that you do is already in the service of God. So therefore, there's no need for mantras or pujas. And perhaps mantras and pujas are more for the duality of bhakti. Where I guess it helps you... Well, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm assuming it helps you get into the mindset and also a way of, I guess, focusing the devotion to God, because I'm not sure. I'm not even sure what the, the, I guess, the downside of not doing it. I, I assume it's done to help you focus and to focus your devotion to God, because, because of duality. And, and sometimes you need that focus to, I guess, realign yourself or to focus yourself into the devotion. Whereas non-duality, again, all, all things being genuine, you know, you, you understand that everything is already being done for God. So there is, there is, no, there is no break because it's non-duality. Whereas duality, there can this break where you start being selfish or doing things for people. So you have to perhaps do those mantras to kind of help focus to say instead of doing it for people you're doing it for god perhaps maybe that should not happen you should feel today the lord is happy he look he's smiling today the, the lord is annoyed have i done something wrong huh? you might think all oh, this is fancy but it actually happens baburam or swami premananda ji uh, when he was in belur mat he had the minimum positions. When he passed away, they found one pair of clothes in his in a little bag, one pair of clothes, um, one uh, pair of slippers, uh, sandals, one Gita. I think that was about it. He was the manager of Belurmat. Now, one day he got a new shirt made for himself. He said, you get the old one was torn. And at night, he had a vision. Sri Ramakrishna comes to him in a vision and says, Baburam, tu yamake ki bhule you've forgotten me, you're making a shirt for yourself and nothing for me. <laughs> and then he told the pujari in the temple, Swami Premananda, go up to the temple and see whether the Lord's clothes are all right or not. And they found, I think uh, the bugs had eaten them or something like that. There, there was a hole in the, in, in the shirt or something. Immediately he had a new set of uh, clothes made for, uh, for Sri Ramakrishna. So you see this kind of practice, there's a very touching story about the gopis of Vrindavan, the greatest of all lovers of God, the gopis of Vrindavan. Now the, the heavenly sage Narada, who comes down to earth once in a while, he comes down and he sees, he goes to Vrindavan, it's his, his favorite spot. Um, he says, hey, now he sees a strange sight. The gopi, who is a lover of God, lover of Krishna, but sitting in a yogic posture and doing pranayama like this and meditating. So the Narada said, Oh Gopi, what is this strange sight that I see? Are you doing Patanjali yoga? Uh, to, uh, trying to concentrate on Lord through the yoga? Doesn't your bhakti work anymore? The path of love and the path of meditation. So you have taken to the path of meditation, you know, sitting in asana and breathing control and concentration on the Lord. And the Gopi said, what beautiful words. I have, I've forgotten the original uh, Sanskrit, I think that was. But anyway, it goes like this. He said, Oh Sage, that's not it. You see, what happened is, I am trying to forget Krishna. What do you mean forget Krishna? Today in the morning, you know, of course Krishna is nowhere around. He had long gone to Mathura and all that. But today in the uh, morning, you know, I was milking the cow and I felt that uh, the li little Krishna is there uh, behind me and uh, asking me, oh, give me some milk to drink. And I saw, I turned around and saw Krishna and 
I was so overcome, the pitcher of milk fell down and it was all wasted. Of course, it's just my mind, I know that. It's, a, it's just, I'm just thinking that, it's my imagination. See, it, it's just a waste, you know, I wasted all the milk. So look at the mischief that, that little Krishna is causing me. And then when I was cooking, I was put all the, pot, uh, the pots on the oven and I felt somebody pulling my, uh, my uh, the pigtail, the long uh, knot of hair, somebody pulling my hair from behind. And I look around and Krishna is there and immediately, I fell in a faint and the pot was upset and the cooking was spoiled. So I can't live like this. This is, this is really bad. And so I'm practicing yoga to get rid of Krishna. <laughs> now, Narada is so overcome. The yogis practice all this life after life to get one such vision, which you continuously get day and night, which you're trying to get rid of. So Narada had tears in his eyes. This, this is the complete absorption in God. Uh -huh. There's another funny story that told by the teachers of bhakti, um, sort of poking fun at the path of knowledge. It seems Narada once comes to Vrindavan and standing there and weeping. And the gopis asked him, oh sage, why are you weeping? Uh, this is Vrindavan, so beautiful, your favorite place. And he said, I'm weeping for all those liberated souls, those who got moksha and got liberated before they could see Vrindavan. The bef before Krishna came, many people had got liberation also in earlier, earlier cycles, but they could not see Krishna, they could not see Vrindavan, they could not see the gopis, they could not see this. That's why I'm weeping for, he's weeping for those who have got moksha. <laughs> what is the practice that we have to do? What is the practice? There's a sutra in the Naradiya Bhakti Sutras, maybe my most favorite one, most practical advice. How do we lead our lives? It says, Sarvada Sarva Bhavena Nishchintitehi Bhagavan Eva Bhajaniya. Very beautiful. At all times, in all ways, without care or anxiety, the Lord alone is to be worshipped. Worship the Lord alone when? At all times. How? In all ways. And without the least care or anxiety. You see about this chinta, the Sanskrit word chinta means anxiety, care. Huh. People of the world are ridden, you know, you, you, you have these smileys, the face goes like this and the, and the where we are sad, the face goes like that. And you see mostly people like that face. <laughs> anxiety. There's a Sanskrit word, uh, verse, very funny. Chinta chita samakhyata. Uh -huh. Chinta chita, uh, chita to adhika. Chita nirjivam dahati, chinta jivita meva dahiyati. Very simple Sanskrit. It means anxiety is called, is a play on words. In Sanskrit, chinta means anxiety and chita means the funeral pyre where the bodies, dead bodies are burnt. The Hindus burn, cremate their bodies. So that's called the chita, the fire, the funeral fire, where you put a dead body and burns you up, burns up the body. So he says, anxiety is called that funeral fire. Anxiety is worse than that fire, the cremation fire. Why? Because the cremation fire only burns up a dead body. Anxiety burns up the living body. Hmm. <laughs> Anxiety burns up the living body. I remember in the Himalayas, there was this Swami. I don't know if he's still alive. It was more than 12 years ago. Now, he was old, in his 80s. He used to live in a cave, and then he has this little ashram. I still remember him saying, you know, I have, I have only committed only one sin in my life. And we were sitting near him. We asked, what, Swami? The only sin that I've committed in my life is making this ashram. I was happier sitting in the cave. <laughs> but anyway, we all said, of course, why should you say that? Because we are getting the advantage of meeting you, and so many people are, can, they can come because you have this ashram. Anyway. He was old at that time and he was very obese. He was, uh, um, he was actually huge. And a doctor had come to check up, check him, give, a, give him a check up. He was not keeping well. He was in his 80s. And the doctor was skinny. Now the doctor asked, and this works only in Hindi, so I'll tell you in Hindi and then translate back. The doctor asked, Swamiji, kya khate hai? Itne mote ho gaye. what do you eat, Swami? You have become so fat. <laughs> And then the Swami immediately, he's very witty, he immediately replied. He said, Dr. Sahab, me chinta ko chaba jata hu, or chinta aapko chaba jati hai. <laughs> <laughs> oh, doctor, I, I 
uh, eat up, I gobble up all my anxieties. I, I just <laughs> gobble up all my anxieties. And anxieties are gobbling you up. Your anxieties, your fears, your tensions are eating you up. I eat up all my anxieties. So I have become you know, <laughs> junk, junk food you put on weight. But your anxieties and your tensions and your fears are eating you up. That's why you're so dyspeptic, so skinny. Nishchintitehi, oh. without the least fear, without the least uh, anxiety, God will take care. I thought in that in that last one, he's saying that the the um, was it the guru was uh, or the swami was eating up his eating his anxieties. That's the reason why he's so fat. And I thought the doctor replied back saying, "Yeah, well now it's eating you because it's." When you're unhealthy, it will it will deteriorate your health. I thought that's what he was saying, but no, he's saying that the doctor's so skinny because his anxiety is eating him up. Sarvada at all times. You see, to do spiritual practice, use space, time, object, desha, kala, vastu. How do you do that? If you can't think of God all the time, let me say in the next one hour, conscious deliberation. In the next one hour, I shall only think of Chris, Krishna or of Christ. One hour. Cut it off in time. No other thought allowed. No entry. Put it outside your mind. Uh, outside the mind, there will be a sign. No entry. <laughs> only Krishna allowed inside. One hour. Space. In this space, in my prayer room, or sitting on my meditation mat, in that space, no thought of the world is allowed. Nothing. No thought of the world is allowed. Not even the most serious problem, not allowed in, when I'm sitting there. Space. Cut off that space. In that space. Object. I will keep my mind on the form of Krishna or on, on, the, on the Lord in whatever form you worship. Even the greatest of things, greatest of sorrows cannot shake you. M, the, writer, the author of the gospel, once in Kashi, there's a, such a touching story. He, was, he used to teach the Bhagavatam story of Krishna and the avatars of Vishnu and all to the monks and he was going for the class he was going to teach with the book somebody came ran up to him and gave him a telegram mm -hmm. and he lo looked at the telegram folded it and then he walked on to the class and he was teaching beautifully the monks who were sitting there listening to him one of the monks whispered to the others to, to somebody near him that is a real devotee of the Lord why do you know what was in the, in the telegram? His beloved child passed away. Hmm. Was sick, passed away. He just folded it back and went on with the, with the class. Yeah. There's a, such stories we hear. Uh, who was the great devotee of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? Whose own son had died. Son or daughter had died. And that night Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was supposed to come to their house. And there would be Kirtan and singing the name of the Lord. Hare Krishna, Hare Ram, and the devotees would sing and dance throughout the night. And this gentleman in whose house, he just suppressed the whole news, kept his sorrow, his breaking heart within himself, and conducted the whole program, received the Lord, and sang and danced with everyone throughout the night. So, Sarvada, at all times, under all circumstances, Sarva Bhavena, in all ways, not only by mantra, not only by meditation, but by serving the devotees, by listening to the stories of the Lord, by, by speaking about the Lord, by going on pilgrimage, by doing puja, by studying the scriptures, in all ways, sarva bhavena. And the Lord in, in, in every form, within yourself, the Lord within myself, within everybody else, in the temple, in every place, in every way, worship the Lord alone, sarva bhavena. Sarvada, all the times, and Sarva Bhavena. How? Nishchintitehi, without the slightest anxiety. God has promised, try it, God will take care of your life. You will be taken care of. That's what the Lord wants. That's what the Lord loves. Sarva Bhavena, Bhagavan Eva Bhajaniya. The Lord alone, this emphasis is there. The Lord alone is to be worshipped. Nothing else, God plus something else, no. The Lord alone is to be worshipped. Most practical advice, I think. Very powerful teaching of the higher form of love. Sarvada sarva bhavena nishchintitehi bhagavan eva bhajaniya. At all times, in all places. If you cannot do all times in all places, as I said, particular time, particular place, 
a particular form. At least start with that, then it becomes all. More and more it spreads over. You cannot stop afterwards. Afterwards, it becomes an intoxication. It becomes the most important thing in your life. Nothing else even comes close to it. Everything else slowly drops away from you, and you and the Lord alone. This beautiful story. Okay, I'll tell you uh, later on. Uh, I, th I don't know if I've told you about the, the, the funny uh, incident which I saw in uh, Belurmat. Uh, it was a, it was a, a comedy played out on how a person is transformed from a person who is very greedy about money into a person who is greedy about God. But that's later. In the Q&A session, we'll, we'll talk about that. I pray to Sri Ramakrishna, the Holy Mother, Swami Vivekananda, to bless all of us present here with a drop, at least a drop, of that ecstatic love of God. May it come into our hearts and transform our lives. May we become the lovers of the Lord in this very life itself and make our lives <coughs> blessed. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu Okay. <clears throat> So the way of love, part two. I was hoping he would. He was practically almost telling that joke story, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know where the Q and A is at for this one. So, anyways, I, I need to move on to a different Guru Swami so we can get a little bit more interpretations of Bhakti. I'm probably not going to do as many videos because we've been on this subject for quite long enough, and it's roughly the same. But I still want to hear how other people interpret it just in case there are some deviations to it and how to interpret love or bhakti. Um, I really like the way Swami here interpreted it and explained it. So if you like my content, please consider subscribing. Thumbs up, thumbs down, down below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next vid. Actually, you know what? I almost forgot. And so the question here, um, I had to take a picture. So why are you so interested in Hindu stuff? So, I wasn't originally interested in Hindu stuff. Um, this channel started off with me and a friend, and he ended up moving, and I kept that as a React channel, and I, you know, put people out there to suggest anything they wanted me to react to, you know, different films and whatnot. Um, but it ended up switching to this, because um, as I was watching... Um, as, as I was watching some of this Hindu videos, I started realizing a lot of this stuff is how I think about life, or ways, a, a way of life, if you were to say. Um, and it's things that, it's actually quite fascinating to me, and it's something that I could take and to kind of give to give to people, not physically give. Like, here you, here you go, I have a pen. <laughs> it's something I could give to people and hopefully make their lives a little bit better. Um, or at least point them in a direction of this way because I will say uh, this is definitely not in the Western world as much and a lot of it can be used to help better people's lives although I will say it's very how do I say very difficult for them to get into this because it's very different uh, than what's being taught taught in the, U in, in the Western world and probably honestly majority of the world um, to think that, oh, this is not me, you know, that's very foreign. Um, to think that I am this consciousness, that's very foreign. So I'm trying to find ways to translate um, what they're saying into something that could be understood practically, I guess, or understood, just understood. I guess that's the simplest way to put it. And again, that's the reason why I have many different understandings of these things uh, like how I have the three understandings of material, the materialistic world the Advaita Vedanta world, non-duality world, and then this middle ground where I'm trying to have people who believe in the materialistic world to hop onto the middle ground to hopefully maybe hop onto Advaita Vedanta itself you know, or at the very least find a way to make the materialistic world less suffering if we were to keep it in the materialistic world and that's the method that I, I've been using for myself. 
Um, I, I never once thought that I am, you know, this consciousness. I thought about, uh, yes, I'm this body, the body's mind, the brain is me. But then as uh, you look at science where some people have certain sections of their brain missing, and so you're not quite all of the brain. <laughs> There's maybe a certain section of the brain that's you. But nonetheless, that uh, the teachings of this is very helpful to help relieve a lot of people's stress and also hopefully, how do I say, I want to humble people but these are not, so far I don't think any of the techniques humbles people. But yeah, but at least pe for people who are generally nice, Nice people suffer in this world, but if you can find a way to have them suffer less, that's what I'm trying to discover. And I, like I said, originally it wasn't meant to be it. I just reacted into Hinduism, just our reaction channel in general. But I'm start. I started to see a lot of the things the way I think, the way I see things in this, and uh, and I just started got interested in uh, interested in it. And now I am kind of in my mind translating it from those three perspectives, Advaita Vedanta, this middle ground, I don't know what to call it yet, and then the materialistic world, where I can still interject some of Advaita Vedanta into these other two and hope to get people into a less suffering path, I guess you could say. But yes, anyway, I've always interested in and fascinating in how people act, talk, uh, perceive things, um, how they see things, how they think, and this is kind of one of those ways too. Because again, like uh, the thing I noticed in the at least in the Western world, and I'm sure it's happening in developed cities, is this this entitlement mentality where because they are whatever it may be, whatever they identify as, they are entitled to something, and it's something that's growing because. I think this entitlement grows because of the lack of struggle. So if if there's a lack of struggle in a city, a country, a state, or whatever it may be, they start thinking of other issues, other struggles, other entitlement. Something Sadhguru says before is that, uh, you know, hungry, one problem. Hungry solved, 99 problems, which is very true. I mean, there's a, yes, just leave it at that, we'll leave it at that. Uh, again, just human interest, human fascination, how human thinks, how human can end suffering, or at least lessen suffering, learn about humans, <laughs> it's weird to say as though I am not human, uh, but oh, and then to pass that knowledge on to people who may need it, who to hopefully to lessen their suffering. Okay, so that's the end of the video, you know what to do. Thanks for watching.